It's almost time. No, not that time. Time to worship the King of Kings. Get your Bible, grab your coffee and your family, and let's get ready to worship in just a few minutes.
Hey, good morning. Welcome to Frontier Church. I'm Pastor Chris, and I am thrilled that you've decided to join us today for our worship service. Um, this week, we're all online together, so uh, interaction is encouraged, uh, as always, but especially so today. It's the way we get to do fellowship right now while we're all online. So uh, use the comment section below. Uh, don't forget to put your name in the comments where you're joining us from. Um, also, don't be bashful about using the like button or the heart button. Uh, that's fully and totally encouraged. Um, use it for your amen. Use it uh, as raising your hands during the song uh, while you're singing. All of that stuff is totally encouraged. So don't be shy about that. And uh, why not take a second and share this video? Um, share the link with your friends on your Facebook page. Uh, you know, there's no better time to let them know what you're doing this morning and invite them to hear the gospel and uh, learn what it means to worship the King of Kings, King Jesus. And, uh, you know, this morning, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about Jesus's kingship. So um, would you join me this morning in lifting up your voices? You know, Psalm chapter 9 says, uh, verses 1 and 2, it says, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Would you join us this morning in lifting up your voices and worshiping King Jesus with us? Hello, it's good to be with you this morning. I'm Patty with my son, Paul, and we're excited to lead you in worship today. I was thinking of the psalm that begins, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. So let's worship the Lord together in song beginning with King of Kings. Thank you. 
It's announcement time. All right, calm down. Pastor Chris, it's not that exciting. I know, but I try to bring some excitement to it. Um, I have a couple of items this morning that I just want to go over. One very important one. I'm going to lead with that. Um, if you're a member of this church, part of being a member of this church is participating in the business of the church. And tonight is our congregational meeting. This is our annual business meeting. So, um, if you're able to make it, please let us know. If you don't have the link and you're a member and you're supposed to be there, we want to get you set up. So let me or Pastor Steve know and we can get you the link to the business meeting. We're doing it via Zoom, obviously, since we are not in person at the moment. So uh, that's very important. If you're a member of the church, we're going over all the stuff pertaining to our annual business meeting tonight. Second, and equally as important, is... Um, Prairie Ridge Elementary, which has been our main outreach uh, focus over the past several months. Um, we've adopted Prairie Ridge as one of our community outreach projects uh, and a place that we want to partner with and serve and love on our community. Um, so every month we've been trying to do something awesome to bless, you know, the staff and the, the admin and, and, and the janitorial staff and all the people that are working there right now. And... Um, so we delivered fruit and, cheese, fruit and cheese trays last week to the school, and they were so appreciative of that, um, that we could provide a little snack for them. And uh, they were still talking about the Christmas baskets that we dropped off last month. They were blown away that we did that. So uh, all that to say, it's not, uh, we're not trying to toot our own horn. And instead, what I'm trying to do is let you know that you are making inroads with the elementary school, they are feeling blessed and we're building relationships with them, which is the whole point. We want to bless and serve our community. We want to get to know our community and above all, we want to just be a blessing to them. So good job, church. We're doing that well. Um, also, if you have ideas of things we could be doing to serve them and bless them, please, um, bring them, uh, to our attention. You can let, um, Pat or Lynn know they're heading up our outreach to Prairie Ridge Elementary. So uh, if you have ideas, please pass them along. Um, you know, we're looking for whatever we can do. Any ways we can bless them. It takes creativity in this time of the pandemic. And uh, we really, really want to bless this school who's working so hard to provide in-person learning and online learning for our students in the community. All that to say, good job, church. We are reaching out like we've been talking about. We are serving our community, and I encourage you to continue to do so. Um, also, don't forget our uh, small groups. Uh, our small groups are back. Um, they are going, but it's not too late to join them. So if you are interested in participating in the small groups, and I know that we have a slide for that with all the information, so we're going to put that up right now. Um, we have several going right now, and then I am still working on mine. It will probably come mid-February. Um, that's going to be more of a, a the Bible in your life kind of a study 
and it's going to be more orientated to people who are new to their faith or have questions about their faith. So um, if you, that interests you, if that's something you want to do, reach out to me and I will try to keep you in the loop as that develops. I'm still working on getting it together. Um, so those are the announcements this morning. Um, but we're not done yet because I want to pray for us before we continue any further. So would you join me in praying this morning? Let's bow our heads and go before the Lord. Lord, Father God, Lord, we gather this morning to worship you, to praise you, Lord. Lord, we come before you and we lay our burdens at your feet. Today, this day, your Sabbath day, Lord, we come to you to find rest. We come to you to find peace. Lord, we come to you to find life. Lord, I pray this morning over each and every person joining us this morning. Lord, that our hearts would be open to the message that you have for us. Lord, that our ears would hear the challenge you have for our lives, Lord. Lord, whatever has been distracting us this week, Lord, let us refocus on you this morning. Lord, we pray for our community here at Frontier Church. We pray for the Carbon Valley, Lord. We pray for your blessing in the community. We pray for opportunities, Lord, to advance your kingdom and make your name great. Not just here in the Carbon Valley, Lord. Yes, here, because you've put us here, but not just here, Lord. Across the front range of Colorado, Lord. Across the United States, Lord. Across the continent, Lord. Across the world. Lord, help us look for the ways that we can be advancing your kingdom, Lord, to do your work. Lord, we submit ourselves to you today. Lord, we pray for Pastor Steve this morning as he prepares to bring the message. Lord, we pray that you would speak boldly through him, that you would speak uh, loudly through him, Lord. And Lord, that he would be a yielded vessel to you. Lord, give us eyes to see, give us ears to hear, and give us hearts ready to receive. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Today we'll be reading Mark chapter 11, verse 27 through 33. And I'll be reading from the English Standard Version of the Bible. And they came again to Jerusalem, and as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him. And they said to him, By what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you the authority to do them? And Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question. Answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Was the baptism from John was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Answer me. And they discussed it with one another, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why then did you not believe him? But shall we say from man? They were afraid of the people, for they all held that John was really a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. And Jesus said, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. and made you king of the world. You're not the boss of me. Don't tell me what to do. <laughs> Man, if I had a dollar for every time I made a snotty comment like that as a younger person, I could probably afford to be your pastor for free. 
What is it for many of us that causes us to not respond very well to authority? I think it can be pride or stubbornness or selfishness, sometimes self-centeredness, um, or just uh, a refusal to acknowledge the rightful place of authority. Well, what about Jesus? What about his authority in our lives? Do we acknowledge and recognize his authority? Last week, Pastor Chris taught us that Jesus has authority in our lives, in our churches, and over our future. Well, what gives him the right? Who made him the king? It's an important question because uh, the answer to it will determine whether we approach Jesus' instructions uh, as helpful hints or as marching orders. In fact, it was the very question that was asked of him in our passage for today. Um, and I hope that we'll find as we take a look at it this morning in Mark chapter 11 and 12, that Jesus' authority was grounded in his identity as the Son of God. As we continue on in our series, Here Comes the King, uh, we're going down the home stretch of Mark's gospel. As I said, today we're at the end of chapter 11 and moving into chapter 12, and we see that Jesus has entered into Jerusalem. He's begun to go head to head with the Jewish religious leaders of that time to establish his rightful authority over God's kingdom and to convince the people that God's kingdom is not an earthly kingdom and that it would be like no other kingdom that they had ever seen or heard about. And as he did that, there was a tension that arose, a tension between himself and the religious leaders that culminated in his death, uh, a death that played right into God's plan. So far, Jesus has traveled to Jerusalem uh, he's there. He's going to celebrate the Passover. He is there to meet his date with destiny. As he said, he would be uh, arrested and abused and crucified and three days later would raise again to life. He came in and the people shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they waved their palm branches. And he went right to the temple, the seat of authority. And he didn't like, he, in fact, he was disgusted with what he found there. And he started flipping over tables and, and barking out orders, telling people uh, that they ought not to be turning God's house into a den of thieves. And he was captivating the crowds with his authoritative, authoritative teaching. Well, the religious leaders at the time, the chief priests, the scribes, the elders, they were furious with Jesus. I mean, he was undermining their authority. In verse 18, it says they were seeking a way to destroy him. And so when Jesus later that week returned to the scene of the crime there at the temple, they were ready for him. I want you to turn in your Bibles uh, to Mark chapter 11, uh, and we're up to here, verse 27 and 28. I'll give you a second to turn there. Mark chapter 11, verses 27 and 28. It says, And they came again to Jerusalem, and as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him, and they said to him, by what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you this authority to do them? In other words, what gives you the right? Who made you king of the universe? Where do you get your authority? They were looking at things very much from a human perspective. Uh, they, from a perspective of, of lineage, right? Who were your ancestors? What's your bloodline? What was your training? What schools? Who did you study under? Uh, what's your experience? Have you served in the temple? Have you served in your local synagogue? What is your position? And those are all, from a human perspective, uh, things that do give people authority. They were things that gave these religious leaders a certain amount of authority. But sadly, they were denying God's ultimate authority, the true source of authority, which was the authority that Jesus came with. Well, they thought they had him cornered here, right? I mean, think about it. If he appealed to a human authority, they could quickly shoot him down, pointing out that he was the son of a Nazarene carpenter, uneducated, unqualified, uh, un and unappointed. And then if somehow he decided to appeal to divine authority, well, they 
that was just crazy talk, right? People would surely see that as what it was, a lunatic raving about, uh, and they could charge him with blasphemy, and they could be rid of him once and for all. So it was a win-win for them. It was a great, perfect, trapping question. And it introduced into uh, what we call the Passion Week, this last week of Jesus' life, this element of tension. It was a tension uh, that actually started, as we said, back in verse 18. But it's the tension that we need to bring our drama to a climax. Without this tension, we wouldn't have had the crucifixion. Uh, but the time wasn't quite right. So Jesus, rather than playing into their hands, flipped it on its head, flipped the script, as it were. Uh, and, and instead of answering them directly, he asked them a question, a question that he knew would shut them up, at least momentarily. He said, I'll answer your question if you answer mine. So Jesus in verse 30 asks this question, the baptism of John, was it from heaven or was it from man? The baptism of John. Now think about what Jesus was asking. Here was uh, John the Baptist, uh, was his uh, predecessor, right? The one who paved the way for him. He had very dramatically preached and baptized for repentance. Repentance from the status quo, which didn't speak well for what these religious leaders had been teaching and the ways that they had been leading. In fact, when the Pharisees and the Sadducees, some of the religious leaders of the time, came to see what was going on with John, he called them a brood of vipers, right? And indicated that they would be recipients of God's wrath. So obviously, John the Baptist had not been popular with the religious leaders of the time. And it was also likely known that John the Baptist had strongly endorsed Jesus as the Lamb of God, the one who came to take away the sins of the world. But here's the problem. John was very popular with the people, and they had flocked to hear his teaching and to receive his baptism. Well, you can hear the debate going on. These uh, religious leaders would have made great politicians. They're thinking, okay, well, how do we answer this question? I mean, the people, he's, John's very popular with the people, so we got to be careful about how we answer it. If we say his teaching was from heaven, then he'll turn around and say, well, why didn't you listen? Why didn't you believe him? And yet, if we say it was from man, well, whew, that could start a riot. The people would go crazy. And so they thought very astutely, they answered, we don't know. And Jesus said, okay, then I'm not going to answer your question either. Except then he went on to answer their question in story form, as he so often did. As we move on into uh, um, Mark chapter 12, verses 1 through 9. And I'm not going to read the whole thing. You can do that on your own. But I want to, to take a look at the, the story. Here we have a man who, who creates a vineyard. Uh, and then he skips the country, right? Leaving the, the tending and the harvesting of his vineyard in the hands of tenants. From what I understand, it wasn't an uncommon thing to do. And it might be tempting for us to think of this uh, landowner, this vineyard creator, as um, sort of a neglectful real estate mogul. Well, I'll just, uh, uh, I don't need to be involved in the day-to-day -day operations. I'll just go on and enjoy my life and I'll let the, 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 the tenants take care of the hard work. Um, but, but I don't want us to overlook the hard work and the care that goes into making a vineyard a reality. This week I had the opportunity to catch up with uh, an old friend from high school, uh, Russ Langord. And it turns out that Russ, uh, who I haven't spoken to in 30 years, uh, is, uh, has a vineyard. Uh, he works for a vineyard and then he has his own vineyard and, and, uh, and a wine company. And so I reached out to Russ and I asked him, uh, what's involved? How much work is involved? How does it compare the work of creating the vineyard versus the work of maintaining the vineyard? And he confirmed what I thought I knew, that, that it's not even close. The, the, the bulk of the work goes into uh, the planting, the, the, the getting ready, the, the preparations for the vineyard, and then the, and then the patience to wait. Uh, look at what it says here. The, the, this landowner, he built the fence around. Uh, he obviously had to plant the vines for the vineyard. He dug the pit for the wine press. He built a, a tower so they could keep watch and make sure that no one was coming in and stealing their crop. 
uh, and, and nurtured those grapevines, pruning them just right to get the fruit to the point where it would come out. Uh, Russ tells me it takes at least three years before you even begin to see, and then a few more years after that, before you really begin to see a, a bumper crop of, of grapes coming out of your vineyard. And so the, the landowner had done the work. He had created this vineyard. This was his labor of love, his baby, and he left it and entrusted it into the care of people he trusted to, to then take care of it, keep it watered and pruned, and then to harvest those grapes. And it was his right then to come back and ask for a portion of those as the landowner. Well, evidently, for these tenants, it was out of sight, out of mind, right? The, the owner was long gone, and, and they began to feel uh, some ownership, some rights uh, in what happened with the harvest of this vineyard crop. Uh, and so the, the owner sent one servant after another back to try to collect his rightful share of this crop. And, and the, the tenants uh, rejected them, refused to acknowledge the authority with which these servants came from the owner. Uh, one by one, these servants uh, were turned away. They were beaten. They were battered. They were humiliated. Some were even killed. So finally, the landowner decides to send his own beloved son. Surely they'll respect my son. Surely they will recognize and acknowledge the authority of my son. But these tenants conspired together and thought somehow, if we eliminate the son, then we'll be next in line to inherit the vineyard. And so, as we see in verse 8, they took him uh, and they killed him and they threw him out of the vineyard. And Jesus asked the question, what will the owner of the vineyard do? He'll destroy those tenants, and he'll give the vineyard to others, right? I love Matthew's version of this story, uh, where he let the people who were listening give the answer, and they said, he'll put those wretches to a miserable death, and he'll let the vineyard out to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their seasons. And that brings us to uh, the first point I want us to pay attention to today, and that is failure to acknowledge the authority of the Son is a recipe for disaster. Failure to acknowledge the authority of the Son is a recipe for disaster. Now, we've said that Jesus' authority is grounded in his identity as the Son of God. And it's pretty clear to us as we look at this parable with 2020 hindsight what the meaning of the parable is, right? The vineyard was a well known metaphor for Israel, God's people. God, as creator, defender, provider for his people, is the vineyard owner. And there's a clear connection with this parable and, uh, and what we might see in Isaiah chapter 5 in the beginning, where there's a vineyard owner who creates a vineyard with love and care, the same way this vineyard owner did. Uh, the difference is, in Isaiah 5, it was the vineyard itself that refused to produce. But here it's those who were put in charge. Those charged with caring for the vineyard, uh, in this case, the Jewish religious leaders who were preventing the owner from enjoying the fruit of the vineyard. They had led God's people so far astray that they couldn't even recognize his son when he sent them to them. Even the Jewish religious leaders who had confronted Jesus understood that this parable was about them, that they were being cast in the, in the role of the wicked tenants in this parable. In verse 12, they say, and they were seeking to arrest him, but they feared the people, for they perceived, they're pretty bright guys, they perceived that he had told the parable against them. Uh, and so they left him and went away. We can even see, as we look here at this parable, connections between the abused servants and, and some of the prophets that God had sent through the Old Testament, even John the Baptist himself, that God had sent to try and correct the problem who had been abused and eliminated. And we know, of course, that the son who came representing the authority of the father and was also rejected and abused and killed is Jesus, of course. The religious leaders who recognize that this 
parable was told against them wouldn't be dissuaded. They refused still to acknowledge the authority of the Son. They continued to plot against Jesus, and within in a few days they would have their way, and as it turned out, they would have God's way in putting the Son to death. Now, let's pause and soak that in for a minute. Jesus, who said, I and the Father are one in John 10, 30, is our ultimate authority in God's kingdom. He's our ultimate authority. The things he tells us to do are not optional. They're not suggestions. They're not just good ideas for life. Oh, we should see what Jesus has to say about this. No, these are marching orders. We can't pick and choose the things we like that he said. We can't pick and choose the things that match what we already believe in our own view of life. That's why we've spent this past year uh, journeying with Jesus as we, as we studied his life and teachings through the Gospel of Mark. Now, like Pastor Chris said, Jesus has authority over our lives, over our church, over our future. And a failure to acknowledge his authority in any of these areas isn't just a bad idea. It's a recipe for disaster. Uh, yes, uh, don't mishear me. We do live under his grace. Uh, and we do make wrong choices. And there is forgiveness available when we acknowledge and repent of those wrong choices. But at our heart, our intention, our passion, our deepest desire in life had better be to follow him wherever he leads, to do whatever he asks. That's got to be our passion. That's got to be our intention. So this is what I was thinking about this week. We like to think of ourselves as uh, the new tenants, right? The ones to whom the vineyard was given after the landlord got rid of those wicked tenants. Um, the ones that God brought in to oversee the vineyard. And, and we like to see how the church was grafted in as, and is a part of God's people now. But what separates us from the wicked tenants? What makes us different from the Jewish religious leaders, those wretches that were put to a miserable death by the angry vineyard owner? Now, again, grace aside, grace obviously separates us. But in the way that we approach it, in the way that we handle it, in the way that we recognize and acknowledge the authority of Jesus, we better make sure that the church is acknowledging the authority of Jesus uh, and is bearing the fruit of his kingdom. I look around here in America and, and, and I see what so much of the church has begun, become and what so much of the church is, is fighting for and, and standing for and, 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 and investing themselves in. That so much of the church has become just a, a comfortable place to gather uh, with people who think like us and look like us and act like us. Uh, that, that so much of the church has become maybe a political force to be reckoned with or, or at the very least a pawn to be played. That the church has become for many a wall to hide behind as we lob grenades at the very ones that Jesus called us to lay down our lives for. I don't think that Jesus wants the church to become that. I think the church in America, as the church in America, we better take a look constantly. We better take a look and make sure that we know who we are serving and from whom we're taking our marching orders. Unless we want him to take away the vineyard and give it to others who will take better care of it, who will acknowledge his authority, who will seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, We'd better be in the business of repenting and humbling ourselves and surrendering to his instructions to love God and love our neighbors, to make disciples of all nations, to serve the least of these. These are the things that Jesus showed us were at his heart, and they better be at our heart, too. Which brings us to uh, the second point I want us to get from today's passage, that surrender to the authority of the Son is a recipe for hope. 
right? A refusal to acknowledge his authority as a recipe for disaster, but a surrender to the authority of the son as a recipe for hope. I don't want to leave us feeling beat up, right? Uh, I don't, I'm not making specific accusations here. I don't want to give us the impression that a few bad grapes in the church will represent the whole vineyard. The, church, the kingdom of God is alive and well in the church of Christ. The kingdom of God is alive and well in Frontier Church, Carbon Valley. But it's our responsibility to pray and to make sure that we're constantly evaluating Constantly making sure that we're seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness, that we're constantly surrendering to the authority of Jesus. You know, it's great to take a stand in the name of Christ. Let's just make sure that uh, we're standing for the things that he wants us to stand for. Jesus ended his parable with a strict warning, but also a message of great hope for those of us who have surrendered our lives to him. Look at verses 10 and 11. It says, Have you not read the scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Jesus is quoting a scripture from Psalm 118, which was recognized as a, a, a prophetic messianic psalm, <clears throat> that this stone would be rejected, uh, but would become the cornerstone. The stone didn't cease to exist because it was rejected. The stone didn't become any less important. In fact, uh, because it was rejected, it lived on bigger, stronger, and with greater purpose. The fact that the Jewish religious leaders those who were given the responsibility and the privilege to care for and protect God's people, to lead God's people, just because they rejected the authority of the Son does not mean that the Son lost his authority. It doesn't mean that the kingdom came to an end. The kingdom lives on. The kingdom lives on. In fact, this rejection only served to strengthen and broaden the influence of the Son, as he became the cornerstone, the foundation of a new manifestation of God's people and the new trustees of God's kingdom, the church. The hope in which we live is that God, in his grace and through his Son and by his death and resurrection, has extended to us an invitation to turn away from our sin to let him pay our debt, to surrender our lives to Jesus, and to be adopted into his family. So, <clears throat> both the warning and the hope for us in this passage lie in acknowledging and surrendering to the authority of Jesus Christ. His authority is not man-made. It's not based on what school he went to, who his parents were, uh, uh, or, or knowing the right people in the right positions. Jesus' authority is grounded in his identity as the Son of God. So, if Jesus is the ultimate authority in our life, in our church, in our future, there's a few things that we should be doing. First of all, we must always work to be as familiar as possible with him and his ways. Be as familiar as possible with him and his ways and his instructions. And how do we do that? I know I sound like a broken record, but I don't know any better way than spending time daily in his word and spending time daily connecting with him in prayer. Not only speaking to him, but listening, listening and, and, and listening with our heart for what it is that he would have us do. That leads to the thing number two. Thing number two is check with him on every decision. Check with him on every decision. Now, there may be some things where God allows us to follow our preference, uh, to, to use human reasoning to make a good decision. But we should always check with him. Sometimes the things he wants us to do uh, don't make sense from a human perspective. Sometimes the things he wants us to do might not be what we think is in our best interest. 
but he lays out his will for us in his word, and he speaks to our heart through his Holy Spirit, and he makes us, helps us to make decisions based on his will. So, work to be as familiar as possible with him and his ways. Second, check with him on every decision. And number three, evaluate regularly to make sure you're not going the wrong direction. Evaluate regularly to make sure you're not going the wrong direction. We should be doing that in our lives. We should be doing that together as a church. And we can do that in a number of ways, right? We, we can evaluate um, the things we're doing, the things we're teaching, the things we're, we're, we're uh, uh, the ways that we're discipling people, the programs we're involved in, and make sure that we are uh, doing the things that he laid out, that we are pursuing uh, the values of his kingdom, that we are seeking first his kingdom, that we are working to make disciples of all nations, that we are loving our neighbor as we love ourselves, and that we are serving and loving the least of these. That's what I want to be doing in my life. That's what we want to be doing as Frontier Church Carbon Valley. So who made him king of the world? God did, right? Jesus' authority is grounded in his identity as the Son of God. And he has the right and the privilege and the desire to speak into our lives to guide us into his more preferable future. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are our Savior, and we want you to always be our Lord. We want to acknowledge and surrender to your kingship, to your authority, to your desires. We want to be doing the things that you want us to do. We want to be about your business. We want to serve you. We want to be your hands and feet in the world. We want to represent you well. We want our words and our actions and our thoughts to bring you glory and honor and praise. For you are our authority. You are our king. You are our cornerstone, the rock upon which we found our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.
Amen. Indeed, Jesus is our cornerstone. Uh, as we go out into the world this week, uh, would you join me in our benediction today? Our benediction is from 1 Timothy 1.17. Read along with me, if you will. We are committed, multiplying followers of Jesus Christ, reaching up, reaching in, and reaching out. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace and be blessed.